Did you know that Jesus is anti-American? That's right. He's, he's not an American. By golly. Can't be. Because you see, his doctrine and his dogmas are all messed up. He teaches and preaches love your enemies and tries to tell you to, you know, accept those that the violent man, you know, and that at times you need to use violence in order to accomplish, you know, the kingdom of God. And, you know, that's kind of like the American way. You know, God ordains certain wars and certain countries to be in charge so that we can go out and, you know, we have to stop evil, so we need to kill them in order to save them. You know, the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force, so we have to forcefully pursue the gospel on other people. Kind of like what the Catholics said that they did during the Crusades. We have to take back the city of God. After all, those miserable Jews have it. Oh, but what about their doctrine that they used in order to do that? Oh, but they were corrupt, you see, because after all, it wasn't God's war. They said that they were doing it because they were saving, you know, the city of God, Jerusalem, from those Muslims. You know, kind of like what people do today. You know, we have to save America from those Muslims. After all, that's what these modern crusades today are about, aren't they? You know, oh no, Sharia law is taking over America. Oh no, you know, we've got mosques. We've got all these things that are so evil. Or are they? You see, the Catholic Church at the time was really manipulating the people by using these favors and all this monetary gain to buy a property. Because once the king had sent, you know, certain armies to go to you know, fight these battles, well then, you know, the, the church moved in and kind of bought out some of these properties, you know, and they owned favors and they owned indulgences and they were able to do things behind the scenes that had nothing to do with God and country. And today the same thing is happening. You see, there's a lot of people who honestly are messed up in their head. You know, they get caught up in religious fervor. You know, kind of like what some Muslims did recently over somebody making fun of their religion. They got caught up in religious fervor and unfortunately people died from it. The same thing is true in Christianity. It happens all the time. It happened in Constantinople when they slaughtered lots of other kinds of Christians because Constantinople had been at that time the center of Christianity for the Byzantine Empire. Oh, we don't remember that happening. And then also like in Rome, the same thing had happened when there was this takeover of the papacy or of the, I should say, the Romanist church in order to centralize all religion to be in and of authority of Rome, certain Christians were slaughtered in the hills of Italy. Oh, we don't talk about that. And even as you keep going on and on, anytime that you see the church involved with the state, you see wars that are supposedly of God being a doctrine that now we have a godly war. There aren't any. Did you know that? When we were told that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness, high places, that wiped out from that moment on your right to kill anyone. They really did. You don't have the right to take life. You haven't been given the scepter. As a matter of fact, the scepter is held in Jesus' hands. No longer do you have the privilege of taking life. You think you do because you have the freedom to choose to own a gun. You have the rights and privileges in a land that's violent by nature to own what you call self-protection rather than God's protection. Because after all, God can't deliver you. God can't save you. People, whenever they want to invent a doctrine, they take something from Scripture, take it out of the Scripture, make it one line, and then build a huge explanation of why they get to do something according to one Scripture. That's what a doctrine basically is. It doesn't say, let's line up all the Scriptures in a line and make it all fit. Because, after all, we can't make all of it fit. There are contradictions in Scripture. And we don't know how to make that fit. Well, I do. You see, Jesus said from that moment that he came on earth, you think you know what you're doing. 
and he said it to the Jew, and he said it to basically you and I today whenever we get into these legalistic documentations of dogma and doctrine where we think we know religion and we're going to argue about what God said as opposed to what man does. And whenever that happens, you have to go back to what God said, what Jesus said, because Jesus flat out said, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know who your father is. I do, so listen to me. God the Father came to the people at the time and said, look, listen to him. This is my beloved son in whom I will please. So anything Jesus has to say in regards to dogma and doctrine, he even went out of his way to explain it bluntly when he said things like, hey, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say unto you. Which means that anytime you want to find out what God really means, why don't you look for what I say unto you? Because anytime Jesus is that forceful or that adamant about what he's saying, I think we need to pay attention. And that happens in the violence that's in this land of this time of, in America. Because people have this reality check or they think that, oh my God, you know, I'm entitled to take life, end life. You see, the Christian can argue for abortion but the Christian also says capital punishment is fine. The two are the same. You're ending life either way. The person who should be against abortion should also be against capital punishment. Why? Well, you see, there's a reality check here. How do you know what's in the man's heart? Well, like, that's the only case I present before the Supreme Court. Let's just say we're in the Supreme Court. I ask you, Supreme Justices, do you know what's in a man's heart? No. Thank you. I ask you, Supreme Court Justices, according to the Word of God, does God know what's in a man's heart? Yes. If God has chosen in such a way to determine that He alone is in responsible for judgment according to eternal salvation, how do we make that decision based upon God either telling us to kill or God telling us not to murder a soul and be eternally damned that person to hell? You see, there's never a case presented like that to the Supreme Court. As a matter of fact, there's never a case presented to you about why you are murdering people today. You know, when you get mad and when you get angry. Jesus didn't make that like an analogy. He didn't say that was something that was just a metaphor. He never said bluntly that it was a simile. He said, this is my kingdom. You get mad, and guess what? Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, but if you get mad, be angry and sin not, because you are committing murder in your heart. As you've seen, religious zealots have gotten extremely mad, and what they've done is created violence. The violent spirit is out. There is a spirit of violence that's out in the world. Now, it's not just a spirit, you know, and you start naming all these weird, you know, humanistic characteristics and start calling them spirits, but there is a power that's called violence, a power that's out in the world that seeks to elevate itself, that dramatically affects catastrophism, that dramatically affects the world and the way that it deals with the reality of the contrariness of peace. You see, the opposite of peace is violence. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, but he's never been called the Prince of Violence. As a matter of fact, there isn't anything about Jesus that is violent. Not one. Sorry. There isn't any way, shape, or form that you could say that when Jesus came as the Son of Man, that he was going to bruise a reed, or that he was going to quench a smoking flax. As a matter of fact, that is the prophecy that is given of Jesus. He would not bruise a bending reed. In other words, something that is gently blowing in the wind that could easily be bent over and broken, he wouldn't even bruise it. And then people come to me and say, but Michael, you don't understand. The zeal of my father's house has consumed me. Jesus went into the temple and cleansed the temple. So, 
somebody got bruised. No, they didn't. You see, that's when people like to create doctrines again. They say Jesus is violent because of one act. But they don't look at the act itself. So let's examine that for a minute. Because that's where this doctrine of violence really tries to build a case for the New Testament. Because nowhere in the New Testament does it say to be violent. Nowhere. They try to use, you know, well, Paul didn't tell, you know, Roman soldiers to quit being soldiers. He said, just do what you're supposed to do. That's because they were under authority, not because they were supposed to run away and, you know, rebel against authority. It would be contrary to Scripture. Just do your wages, do what you're supposed to do. And then if the, you're released, then go serve God. You see, you're under authority, then you're under authority. That's the way it is. Sorry. So, the point is, is that he wasn't condoning the violent person, the Roman soldier, but the Roman soldier, as you've seen in history, refused orders to kill and die for that. Because then he would have the option to make the choices for him and God, not the choice of whether to obey authority or to subject himself to rebellion of where God had placed him in his particular vocation. Same thing is true with a soldier. You know, I, I don't have any problem with soldiers. I don't have a problem with police officers. There are lots of police officers that can go through their entire career without killing anyone. There's always a way, God says. God says that if we would trust him with all our heart, leaning not to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledging him, he would direct our path. We could trust him with our life then, if we choose to. But can you trust someone that is in control of the universe with trusting your life to him who might be able to stop a trigger from pulling a gun if it's pointing at your face? You see, there's an interesting problem there. There's a contradiction. There's this reality check that we need to examine. And that's why we look at this place where people really try to build Jesus into this, you know, he cracked the whip and he was like beating the backs of these merchants and these these salesmen that were in the temple, selling their goods, changing monies, you know, being bankers. The only problem is, when we look a little closer, we see something that's true or not true. He would not bruise a willow. He would not quench a smoking flax. The prophecies all stated that he would be so peaceable, he would be called the Prince of Peace. He would be so mellow that, quite frankly, people were shocked at who he was. And yet the zeal of his house consumed him. So what would you do if you were building a whip, you know, and you were slapping that whip around? If you were told not to contradict the scriptures, if you were told that you were the fulfillment of God's love to the world, if you were told that you would not bruise even a willow or a flax or you would not quench a smoking flax, but you would not bruise a, a willow, then let me ask you this. How would you accomplish that if you were going into a temple and overturning the tables and setting free the pigeons? Oh, pigeons, okay, well, then that's, that's dangerous. Ooh, you know, they go flying away. Or you were driving out the money changers. You see, when you go to a bazaar in another country, it's pretty easy to see how that happens. The problem is, is that a lot of people that do doctrines don't think before they speak. They don't look at the entire equation and say, well, how could this be fulfilled in another way? How can we make these contradictions conformable to God's volume of the book and still be true? And that's the problem with doctrines of men. They don't look at the big picture. If they accepted the fact that Jesus was violent, they would automatically contradict the scripture that says he would not bruise anyone. Bluntly. And so, when we look at the bazaar, as we call it, you know, in third world countries, you can see all these stalls, you know, that are set up with poles, you know, and they got, like, you know, kind of like a covering from the sun, you know, it's kind of like a, almost like a veranda, you know, kind of like thing. And, you know, if you took a whip, you know, and you cracked your whip on that, that corner of the pole, you could pull it down pretty easy. You know, because they had to take up and put down these stalls. They weren't permanent structures. When you want to drive someone, you can crack a whip and scare the stunt out of them. But what kind of whip are we talking about? You know, because most Americans picture this long whip, you know, yeah, ride them in, ride them out, rawhide. You know, cracking the whip on animals, you know, slapping them. Oh, but wait a minute. Jewish law, Jewish 
custom. Jewish traditions were such that you don't do that to an animal, do you? Or do you? Some maybe, some maybe not. Hmm. Now what would happen if Jesus cracked a whip on a person? Would he be in violation of the law? Would he have broken the law? Would he have been in contradiction to what the scripture says he was supposed to do? First of all, according to Jewish law, yeah, the temple guards would have arrested him immediately for whipping another human being, especially a Jew. Because you see, you might be able to whip slaves, but you can't whip another Jew. You would not be able to take a whip and start beating on somebody. Quite frankly, you'd be welts. And if you had welts, you would have to repay. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. After all, there would be the law, according to the scribes and the Pharisees, that they would be able to condemn him with. But we're told he didn't break the law. He fulfilled the law. How could he have fulfilled the law if he had whipped the money changers? How could he have fulfilled the law if he had beaten those that were merchants in his house of prayer? Oh, well, we just glossy over that and we just make it sound like, you know, he beat them because he didn't actually beat them. He just chased them out, you know, kind of like whew, 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 raising it in the air, swirling it around, scaring them with the very force of his zeal. Ah, then you fulfill the law. The zeal of thy house has consumed me. Ah, I'm also telling you, out, 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 out. So if I were like a whirling dermish, in case you didn't know that, that's also a Middle Eastern term. If I were a whirling dermish with a whip in my hand, you know, I think I'd get some attention. You know, I think if I started flipping over tables and driving animals in front of me, as a matter of fact, even if you saw the movies Rawhide, right in they would crack the whip above the animals because the noise drove the people. The noise drove the cattle when it was rawhide. The noise and his very presence caused people to flee out of the temple. Because anything else would have contradicted the laws of the outer court. Did you know there are laws for the outer court? Oh yeah, there's some things you can't do. You could bring the animals in, but you can't drive them in. They were driven out. You can't, like, you know, have all this sweaty behavior in front of the temple of God. Because you can't be in God's presence if you're sweating. Did you know that? Or you'd be consumed. Contradiction of scripture. You see, there's a problem when doctrines contradict scripture. Then you have to ask yourself, how does it fit? Or does it? Is the doctrine of men able to stand the test of the scriptures of God and the reality of Jesus when we look at it face to face. When we look at it a little closer we examine what is he saying to us then? If we can't prove to ourselves that Jesus is violent and that he's able to tell us to go out and kill someone, what are we doing? If Jesus can't show us where bluntly he said, I want you to take the life of another man. If you can't show me what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemies, bless those who despitefully use you, don't curse those who curse you, but bless those who curse you, I want to know, where is the doctrine that says, I can kill in the name of God? Where is that reality check, that gut check that tells me, hey, no problem. They're going to be damned forever in hell. Kill them. Is that what your doctrine teaches you? Because if that's what your God is like, then the world is right. There is no difference between Jesus and the rest of the world. If your doctrine is all about the ability to choose who lives and who dies, if your doctrine is about who gets to decide man's side, about who is righteous and who is unholy, who is godly and who is ungodly. If your doctrine is able to decide in a societal venture that you get to make the end of someone's salvation opportunity, then I question you, what are you doing with what Jesus said? What will you do when you stand before Jesus? 
what is our society doing in the reality of what God said? Because I know what a Jew says, and I know what Jews did up until Jesus came. Up until John, the kingdom of God suffered violence and the violence taken by force. But since John came, the gospel was begun. The kingdom of heaven was proclaimed. I begin to see a new way. I begin to see a more excellent way. I begin to see a reality that goes beyond an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I see something that says, I can't be violent because the violence shall not enter into heaven, but the Prince of Peace that's come into my life shall give me peace and love and joy. He will not allow me to have violence towards another man. Be careful. Be very careful. When you think you've got the doctrines of God down, because frankly, I'll make this promise to anyone that's listening or watching Vidival Doctrine. If you have a doctrine you know, that you're confident of, you're 100% sure, tell me. <laughs> I know, that's a bold claim. Come on, share with me. Tell me. You know, I'll... I'll stop what I'm doing, whatever it may be, and I'll go pray to God about it. You know, I'll go talk to God and I'll talk to Jesus, you know, the Spirit, and we'll have a four-way conversation. We'll sit down and I'll say, Lord, do you want me to answer this man? Do you want me to give him what you would say in this given situation? Do you want me to respond to that person who really is asking you, not me, to explain the doctrine of God as opposed to the doctrines of men? Because, Lord, I, I know you gave me Vidival Gospel and you gave me Vidival everything else to teach, but Vidival Doctrine, Father, you said you wanted to reveal your will, not my will. So, in Vidival Doctrines, if you look at the series and you reach out to understand them, I think you're going to begin to see that in Vidival Doctrine, God is trying to speak to you about something that's in your mind, not in your heart. Because in the heart, there is violence. In the heart, there is evil. In the heart, there is wickedness. In the heart, there is deception. But your mind is being renewed daily by the programming of the Word of God into you, by the realization of Jesus Christ through you, as He works among you to accomplish His purposes, as He wants to change you into the image of His only begotten Son that didn't drive out those in the temple by beating them to death didn't drive out those in the temple with violence or wrath or rage but rather drove them out as any wise man would do when he was herding out those that were yet to be saved and didn't know what they were doing because in reality the money changers had no idea what they were doing they were crooks in the temple of God the businessmen and commercialism that was going on in the temple of God, even as it does today in the churches. You know, monies for tithing and all that kind of stuff being accomplished, you know, oh, well, we can do that because we got grace. They have no idea of what they're doing. But, such is the kingdom of God, because grace and mercy. Do you think God would drive out passing the plate? Or would he just simply tell you, don't do it? You see, at that time, the temple of God, being the central place of all of Jewish worship and accomplishment, was such that it did consume him. And I think that if you look at medieval doctrine, you're going to find that in doctrines, there are a lot of things that men have done that are compromised of what the Word of God and what Jesus said. I challenge you again, the second time. Don't go by the doctrines of man but find out what the doctrine of God is for your life. Because God has a doctrine and he has a dogma that he wants you to follow. And that is the person of Jesus himself. He wants to speak to you directly and accomplish in you his will. So, I say again to you, if you want to know whether you follow a doctrine of man or a doctrine of God, tell me. Send it to me. Ask me. <laughs> I have no problem with that. I had to examine all the doctrines to figure out what? You know, because sometimes I, I just know automatically wrong, but I don't know why, and so I have to go what in order to find out who 
to go where? <laughs> you understand that? That's how I live. And so, in my mind, I wanted to know. And since I do, I know who to ask when I need to know about some doctrine. You may not realize you've been brainwashed, so to speak, heartwashed into accepting, and somehow it's just a wash when it comes to the Word of God because you can't, you can't take this book, open it up, and not find the truth if you really want to know. Jesus said it this way, and so I leave you to do with this one last time for the third time saying, if you really want to know, I will look up your doctrine for you. I will do the research and asking of God. I will go out of my way to even to present a fitty bolt for you. Maybe even use your name if you choose to. But in the doctrine of God, Jesus said it this way, wisdom is justified of her children. In other words, if you were a child, you could accept the wisdom of God for a little child to leave them. But if you're too wise, you will not accept instruction. The wisdom that is justified of her children, Jesus used us to slam against those who thought they knew it all and in reality had forgotten to ask God for wisdom. For God said it this way, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who abradeth not, but give it to all men liberally. And that is why I say to you, if you really want to know if your doctrine of man you're following is accurate to scripture as a doctrine of God, then I'll say to you that wisdom is justified of her children, and I will ask of God who will it not, but gives me liberally all the wisdom that I need at any point in time that I ask him, because I depend upon him for all of my knowledge and instruction and righteousness and mercy and grace and wisdom in order to answer and to give to every man an answer for the hope that lies within me. I will ask, and I will receive an answer. But the question is again, in the wisdom of God and in the doctrines and in medieval doctrine, do you really want to know? <laughs>